It was a different Lent, March 1993. On the 13th of March, it was a warm, sunny afternoon. It was close to 60 degrees outside, and it seemed like spring had finally sprung. I was serving Trinity Church in Frederick, Maryland, and we had scheduled for the next night a confirmation lock-in at the parsonage where I lived. I have to remember that this was a while back when we could do things like that more safely. But my confirmation class was all boys and all rowdy boys. And the other pastor and I were going to spend the night with them at my house. But the news forecast, the weather forecast that day, said that we were expecting within the next 24 hours the storm of the century. It made no sense. It was warm. It was sunny. Everything felt like it was coming alive again. There was a wedding scheduled the next day at the church. And just as things happened, the snow started to fall. Now, Maryland got over a foot of snow in the Baltimore area. Frederick and West, it was in the two-foot range of snow. I had begged the other pastor to cancel the lock-in, and he said, oh, let's go ahead with it. We canceled it because God spoke to me in a way that I had never heard before, saying, you do not want to be locked into a house with eight teenage boys. God was right. And the couple who came for their wedding rehearsal that night, even though the other pastor had gotten on board with the idea that we were talking storm of the century, he asked them to just let him marry them that night. But the bride insisted that God would not let it snow on her wedding day. And God let it snow on her wedding day. I ended up doing the wedding because they came and got me in a big truck with big tires and took me to the Holiday Inn down the road. That's a story for another day because I defied every law of physics getting into a truck with wheels up to here on me. That's what we call the calm before the storm, isn't it? When things seem like they can't possibly go in another direction, and yet they do. I'm sure the disciples were confused at this point. This is a story that takes place not long after Jesus has gone to Bethany to the home of his friend Lazarus. But before he goes there to call him from his tomb, when they find out that Lazarus is sick and he delays the trip and then announces that they're going to go, the other disciples are worried. They said, the people who wanted to stone you are going to kill you if you go there. How could we possibly go? And Thomas, who is always called Doubting Thomas, is the one who stands up boldly and says, then let us go and die with him. Jesus' face is set toward Jerusalem in so many of the stories we read at this time. But I'm sure the disciples, when they got there, were confused because he tells them to get the foal, the foal of a donkey, this colt. And the picture of Jesus, our Lord, riding this donkey, probably with his feet dragging in the dirt, doesn't make for a very grand picture, does it? Not befitting the Savior of the world. And the disciples who thought they were going to go into a time of terror find the crowd is just so excited. Hosanna, they cry. They climb the trees and they cut branches to wave because these are poor folks. They didn't have flags. They didn't have all the trappings of royalty to welcome this king, a king that defied all logic. And I'm sure the disciples were feeling on top of the world. But we know that this, too, was the calm before the storm. Now, generally in the church, I know what happens. People love to come to Palm Sunday. And I love having the procession with little children walking down the aisle waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Usually I have some little guy in a bathrobe and a fake beard being Jesus as everyone welcomes him into Jerusalem and into their lives and proclaims him as their king. We love that celebration. We love to shout Hosanna, but we love to go directly to shouting hallelujah, unfortunately missing what comes in between. The great hymn from the Philippian church tells us that Jesus, who was equal with God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, and he took the form of a servant and submitted to death, even death on a cross. Crosses are on every church just about that we see, Crosses like the one around my neck are in our homes and hanging on our walls. We can't lose sight of the fact that in first century Jerusalem, it was a word that decent people would not even bring themselves to speak because the cross was capital punishment for the worst offenders. 
But there is that in-between, isn't there? And we live in between right now ourselves. We live between the time of Christ's resurrection and the time of his second coming. And right now we're living in a time of great uncertainty because of the COVID-19 virus. I was reading online the other day and I posted an article on the church's Facebook page about grief, the grief that we're all experiencing and this very real part of grief that's called anticipatory grief, which means we don't know what is coming. We just know that it's going to be bad. When we look at the projections of the number of people who might be dead within a month, we're terrified. And staying at home has become something that people are clinging to now. People are afraid even to go out and get their mail from the mailbox without putting on a mask. So how do we survive in these very difficult times? How do we continue to thrive and how do we continue to proclaim our faith when we can't even gather together in our building, which is for a pastor such a difficult reality to face? For me, it comes both from the past and the future. I look to those in my life who have shared their faith with me in such powerful ways, whose witness boldens my own. I think of Miss Betty, one of my all-time favorite church members. Now, not that we have favorite church members, mind you, as pastors. We love you all the same. But Miss Betty was one in a million. I remember Good Friday after the service. We were supposed to leave in silence. But I saw her sitting in the pew and crying, just doubled over crying. And I went to her after the service thinking because her husband was suffering with cancer and dementia, that she was worried about him. And I said to her, is this about Bob? And she said, no, I just cannot believe the depth of love that God had for me in Jesus Christ. She was weeping over God's love that sent God's son to the cross. And there was Delbert. Delbert, who as a child lived through the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic, who lived through two world wars, and other wars, and the Depression. Delbert was in his 90s when I was his pastor, and his wife Miriam was one of the first diagnosed cases of Alzheimer's when it became something that people were really focusing on. He kept her at home for 19 years caring for her. And when she died, he was already about 90, 91 years old. After caring for her for all those years, he was facing surgery that was life-threatening. I went to pray with him in the hospital the night before his surgery. And what he said to me moved me. I asked him, are you scared? He said, what do I have to be scared of? He said, if I wake up here with my daughter and my grandson and my great-granddaughter, that's good. But if I wake up in heaven with Jesus and my Miriam, that's even better. And then, before I was ordained, when I was a seminary student, I did an internship in clinical pastoral education at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., when it was a federal psychiatric hospital. If you can imagine one flew over a cuckoo's nest being the better of the two options, that was St. Elizabeth's back in the 80s. I was assigned to a geriatric ward. I had no keys, so every day my supervisor would take me to the ward, open the door, and lock me in. The overwhelming stench of urine and despair is something I have never been able to shake. These are people who had been hospitalized in a mental facility for some of them 50 and 60 years. They didn't speak, they didn't communicate, and I was told to go in there and be a pastor. I didn't know how to be a pastor in a church in those days, much less in a psychiatric facility. But I would try my best. I would sit and I would sing and then I would repeat the Lord's Prayer in the 23rd Psalm until one day I looked and there was a woman who had looked up and was watching me. She was in her 80s at the time. And I sat down with her and I tried to talk to her and she would just close her eyes. But if I sang, she started to sing with me. And when I said the Lord's Prayer, she started to say the Lord's Prayer with me. And through the weeks into the months, we began to talk and she told me her story. I always made it a point not to read anyone's chart until I had some chance to get to know them. So I wouldn't have any preconceived ideas of who they are or why they're there. So one day, as she had started to open up and talk, I said to her, how did you come to be here? 
and I almost fell off my chair. You gotta remember, I was about 25, 26 years old at the time. She looked at me and she said, oh, I killed somebody. And then she told me the story of her life. When she was 12 years old, she was raped. She became pregnant. She gave birth to a baby boy who died after birth because she was so young. The pastor refused to bury him at the church because it was sacred ground and she was an unwed mother. So she and her father, in the middle of the night, went to the church and buried her baby boy under a shrub. Her family couldn't take the humiliation and so by the time she was a teenager, they put her out of the house and she ended up a prostitute in Washington, D.C. She ended up drinking to the point that she was addicted to alcohol. And one morning she woke up and there was a dead man on the floor and a gun next to her. She was black, the man was white. And instead of trying her and sending her to jail or to execution, they decided the compassionate thing to do was to send her to St. Elizabeth's, where she lived for the next 65 years. I didn't know what to say. Nothing in my experience had prepared me for something like this. And I started to cry. I'm the pastor, I'm the chaplain, and I'm the one who's crying and watching her sit there and look at me. And I will never forget what she did. She reached out and she took hold of my hand and she said, honey, it's okay. That's why Jesus had to come and die. I've never heard a better understanding of grace from a seminary professor or a member of any of the churches I've served or any of my clergy colleagues. It's okay, honey. That's why Jesus had to come and die. Stories like this, stories of people who hold on to hope in the face of insurmountable obstacles move me and inspire me. People who proclaim Christ risen, Christ who will come again, Christ who died on the cross for my sake, remind me of why I do what I do. They give me the courage to get up and move forward every day of my life. There's a lot of bad theology out there right now explaining why God has chosen this time to punish God's people across the planet with this plague. People are quoting scripture about moons turning to blood and oceans boiling. People are saying that the time has come, that we're in the end times. We might be. But Jesus himself said, we do not know the day or the hour. Only the Father in heaven knows. And God did not send his son to die so that we might be punished and punished and punished over and over again. God sent his son that we might live. And as he came, as he lived, as he taught us to love, as he died, as he was raised, he will come again. For me, that's enough. That's enough to get me through whatever crisis comes. That's enough to get me through my own personal grief. That's enough to get me through this virus. No matter what it might do to my body, it will not change the fact that we have a God who reigns. We have a God who saves. We have a God who heals and redeems and restores. But Palm Sunday was really the calm before the storm. The disciples did not know. How could they know what Jesus knew lie ahead for him? They stayed as long as they could and then they fled into the night and still he loved them and still he called them. At the end of the service today, we're gonna to sing one verse of a hymn that I learned in childhood. It is a little bit antiquated and so it's been taken from the hymnal that we have now. It's in a minor key. Unlike most of the Palm Sunday hymns that are joyous, like the one we sang, filled with excitement, all the happy throng, this tells the story of what Jesus is riding to do. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Hark, all the tribes Hosanna cry. 
O Savior meek, pursue your road with palms and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, your triumph now begins. Or captive death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty. The winged squadrons of the sky look down with sad and wondering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. Bow your meek head to mortal pain. Then take, O oh God, your power and reign.